He is a two-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier, almost won the whole thing just a couple of years ago. He is the current leader in Progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year points, and if you ask me, he is one of the most marvelous young minds in this sport. This week, Stone Cold Kyle Welcher joins me on... I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Here we go again. It must be Wednesday. Welcome one, welcome all. Friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. I hope you're all having a great week. And um, we got a fun show for you. And those of you keen to buy can realize... We have two brand new bobbleheads to the collection. Can you see them? Right there, we got a Vladdy Guerrero doing the splits. And then, of course, St. Patrick right up top corner. Two brand new bobbleheads. Um, thank you. The people that gave them to me, they know who they are, and they're very special. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All bobbleheads are welcome here at our humble abode and um big week last week um we kicked off shooting for the 2024 i guess or 2023 but next year's shows that come out in 2024 some of them may be beginning in 20 the very end of 2023 so 2024 season i guess we started shooting for and uh hammered out three incredible shows at La Reserve Beauchene, Beauchene Wilderness Lodge. Um, special place. Love those fine folks. Haven't been there in three years or four years, so it was good to go hang out there, and it is still the same special, remarkable place that it always has been. And then I made it home in time for Father's Day, which um, was great. Got to hang out with my family and just chill. I mean, we literally... Um, just chilled. I mean, um, to me, it's so weird how your life changes. There was one point in my life that that um, a weekend was good if I had a lot of stuff planned. Like, you know, I got to go do a seminar here. I got to go to this party. I got to do that. And now it's just like a weekend's the least amount of stuff possible. That makes a weekend best for me. Um I mean, I like doing things. I like going to things. But I also like just relaxing because um, my brain needs that. It needs to relax sometimes. Um, my brain probably couldn't relax at all if I was like this week's guest because he is our current leader in Progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year points. And, um, you know, this dude is a – I mean, I feel like every week we have somebody on. I'm like, this is a special person. It's going to be a great show. But I'm going to tell you. Kyle Welcher, from the first time I met him, I'm like, the, the way he thinks, the way he looks at things, the way he deciphers things is totally different than the norm, but that is in a good way. Um, he really, truly has an amazing mind, and the way he thinks about things, um, I can't get enough of. And uh, I think you guys will be the same, but I, I don't know that until the end of this. So, hey, do me a favor. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe. If you're listening on a streaming service, please leave us a review because it makes us cool on said streaming services. And we are blowing up there, blowing up here on YouTube. We're blowing up because of you fine folks that tune in each and every week. And I thank you for that. And we're also blowing up because of the awesome folks that agree to come on here and do a show with me. And one of those awesome dudes is Kyle Welcher, a guy who I've wanted to have on here for a while, actually. We had him on, you know, a long time ago, and I've wanted to have him on here for a while, and this is the loser I am. Let me just explain to you. I've said this before, but I love this podcast. I love these conversations. I love getting real with the anglers. I love, in some situations, exposing some anglers that you guys haven't you know, seen that side of them. You just see them competing. I love all that. But the one thing that I hate about this podcast, or any podcast, I would assume, is booking guests. Um, no, we do not have a booker, a staff member that goes out and books them. I just call people up and say, hey, do you want to do a show? 
And uh, thankfully, most of them say yes. Now, Kyle was one who I'd wanted to do a show with for a while. Um, actually, dating back to last season, I wanted to do a show because it was so his season was so off compared to what he normally delivers. So I wanted to talk to him about that. And then this season, I'm like, yeah, I definitely need to talk to him. So I swear to you, last event, I mean, I think he was in third for Angler of the Year at the time or whatever. I'm like, I need to talk to Kyle to get him on the show. I need to, I mean, I need to go up and make the high. Will you come on my show request? And I'm thankful for everyone that that asks and offers to come on. Everybody that's ever asked or offered to come on, for the most part, has been on the show. I am thankful for all of those, but I, and I'm thankful that everyone, but I'm just, I get uncomfortable asking. I'm even uncomfortable talking about it right now, obviously, because it's just weird. I mean, I have no problem saying, hey, will you go on my buddy's podcast? But my podcast seems a little weird, so I get weird with that. But I swear to you, so I'm like, I'm going to ask him um, when I get to this event, which the last event was the Sabine River. Well, lo and behold, I, I don't see him day one. I don't see him till day two, I don't think. I mean, I obviously saw him on stage, but didn't see him in a place where I could say, hey, I'd like to have you on my podcast again. Well, lo and behold, he takes the lead for Angler of the Year, and I sound like I'm the champ chaser. Hey, do you want to be on the podcast? If I had only asked him 24 hours earlier, it would have seemed so much more genuine and cool. But I swear to you, I wanted to get inside his mind. And without further ado, I'll stop babbling, and we will hook up with him right now. Your current leader in progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year points, Stone Cold. Kyle Welcher. So right before I hit record, I thought to myself, um, is it a good thing to be leading Angler of the Year with the biggest break of the season and ICAST standing in the way of the three events that you probably would rather just get to right now? I, I'm ready to go. Like, <laughs> I just want to see how it shakes out. <clears throat> but, you know, it's not much of a lead. And it does give me a little bit more hype for the next month or so. So all that stuff is good for my career, but the hype is not really the, the amount of the lead is not really justified because there's somebody still got to go catch them three more times. It's not like I have a really good shot at winning it. I think I have a shot at winning it, but it's not like I have like an 80 or 90% chance right now. Like if I had a hundred point lead, it'd be a whole lot different, but you know, leading it has its ups and downs. It's not, I don't think it's going to be bad for me because I don't feel I don't feel an above average amount of pressure to catch them in the next ones. It's like, hey, my name's in the hat right now. We're gonna try to catch, you know, we're gonna try to catch them in the next three and hopefully they call my name at the end. Would you feel more pressure if let's say we were going to three Alabama fisheries that you're very familiar with? Would you feel more pressure in this situation? If we were going to three that I had a lot of experience on. I would definitely feel more pressure, but at the same time, nobody's above a bad tournament. You know, every yeah. single tournament that we go to, it doesn't matter what happens in practice. It, it nothing matters. You can have a bad one at any moment. It happened to me last year, like a bunch of times. And then at the, on the same, on the flip side of that, anybody can have a really, really good one in, any week. You know, you, you could just win any week, or you could have come a 90th any week. So. You got you to kind of realize the variance in the sport before you kind of, you know, count your chickens before they hatch. You know, we, we got 33% of the season left. That's a lot of the season left, you know. We've got actually more than that left. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot still that, that can happen. I like how you always work everything. I mean, literally everything is a mathematic equation to you, is it not? I mean, I, that's the only thing that makes sense to me. And some people will say I got my math wrong, but it is, it's a little bit better than 33%, but basically that, you know? Yeah. I don't think a lot of our viewers will catch up on it. <laughs> <laughs> on it being yeah. off. Um, what, what happened last year, dude? Like, I mean, you know, like from the first time I talked to you and I've proudly said this, I was like, this dude's got it and and you've done nothing but prove that every step along the way. But last year was the only time where we've ever, like literally you've not had, like you've had a, a rough event here and there other than that. But last year it just seemed like, I mean, the classic was cool, but other than that, I'm sure 
it wasn't as much fun as you would have liked. It wasn't near as much fun as this year's been. And, you know, a lot of people have asked me that, friends, family, everybody's asked me that. And the best way that I can summarize it is it just felt like last year I just couldn't get any traction. You know, I had some good practices, and then it's like everything that I, I start off doing in the tournaments, it just doesn't work, you know. And then I'm at 11 or 12 o'clock, and I ain't even got a limit yet, you know, and I'm scrambling around, and it just seems like it happens just day after day after day. And when I finally did get a clue, I would lose one or so something would happen, you know. So I, I definitely made – quite a few bad decisions last year. Like, like when I think back on it, I made quite a few bad decisions last year, but if I think back on it, I made quite a few bad decisions this year. I made quite a few bad decisions my second year and I made some bad decisions my first year. You know, I don't feel like I made, I feel like I made more bad decisions last year, really forcing it, but I don't feel like I made like a crazy amount more bad decisions than I did the previous years. And I thought about that a lot. I'm like, so I wasted an hour here. I wasted two hours here. I ran back to this spot whenever that was a bad, bad decision. And then you think about it like that. And you're like, so I ended up wasting two and a half or three hours of the day. You know, this is just a straight example of just one generic tournament day. And it's like, I wasted three hours, which is a big percentage of your day. But then you think back on it, it's like, I've had tournaments where I wasted like six hours and then still caught them in the other two, you know? So I don't really have a reason for it. Like I still, practiced the ton i worked hard i did everything that i feel like i could do and it's like i just wasn't getting the bites but everything i've ever done in life everything i have hit rough patches it's like i've just ran into brick walls i did it playing poker i've done it fishing before like i've, I've had years fishing before where it's like everything's going good and you hit a brick wall and it's like there's nothing you can do and then whenever that's over a lot of times better stuff happens that's ever happened before that's how poker was and everything it's like i, I have no way to justify it it's just feels like i hit a brick wall every now and then so i would imagine somebody is mathematical and somebody who spends as much time calculating stuff like you do that must be an incredibly frustrating thing to be like you know you know because if, i mean if you're not if you're a golfer and and you're just not your swing is off there is somebody you can watch video you can do everything and be like Here's where I need to fix it. This is you, you can identify the problem and then it just becomes part of fixing it. Fishing's not like that. I mean, you can be doing everything perfect, but you, it's like a split second decision is off. And the more you try to put it on, it seems like it gets the harder. How is that for you to deal with? It, it is very tough, but you just got to understand going in that this is kind of a feel based game like it's not a math based right. game it's not really a technique based deal like the only thing that matters in this is the decisions that you make and our decisions are influenced by a lot of factors you know what's going on on the water like lots of different things influence our decisions and just one bad decision of going the wrong way at blast off or anything and then you say so you go the wrong way at blast off and then you you waste an hour and then you're running back the other way and you're like i'll go hit this 15 more minutes, you go hit this, 20 more minutes, you know, then all of a sudden it's like 1130. And just go in this one wrong direction that morning, you had two starting spots you thought were close, you know, one was slightly better than the other. Just go in that one way in the morning, by the time you get back to the other good stuff, you might have wasted four or five more hours, you know, just going and hitting other stuff. Because And that's the way that I fish is I jump around a lot. Like I always have. I just, I go hit this rock, I go hit this tree, I go hit this dock. And then, like, when, when it's not working, you're not catching them off anything. I mean, you waste a lot of time jumping around, you know. And that's – I mean, it, but that's what it is. It's a feel-based deal. And all you can do is reflect and say, what was I feeling in that moment? And if you – like, you can look back on hindsight and say, I should have never went to that spot. But it's like, well, in practice, I shook off three five panners on that spot. So I definitely should have went to that spot, you know. So you can't really justify it based on the result that you got in the tournament. You have to look at the decision that you made and the information that you had at the time you made that decision, because the information you gained after you made that decision, that could have never made you make a different decision because at that time you didn't have that information. So I try to be objective and think about what I was thinking in that moment. And if I knew better already and made a bad decision, those are the ones that tick me off. Like that's the ones where I already knew better. So it's very difficult. Like you said, fishing is not, mathematical there's not an algorithm to it like it's not it's nothing but a string of decisions you know 
did did you always feel that way or is it taking you a while to get there to you know was there i feel like there had to be a point in your life where you were like i'll figure out this algorithm and then at some <laughs> point you were just like well it's not that if steve kennedy has not figured it out i got no <laughs> shot <laughs> He he is trying to figure it out. <laughs> he, whenever he figures it out, you can give up on the classics for the rest of eternity because he's going to win them all. <laughs> well, I, he's working on it. Um, yep. So this year, what feels different for you? Is it just the speed of your decisions? Is that is like it's not just the result, or is it literally just the result? It feels the same, with the exception of Lake Murray. Almost every single tournament day from my starting spot, I've caught two or three that, like, you're happy to weigh in, you know? Yeah. Like, it's just like every single morning when I put the trolling motor down, it's like I've been fishing 20 minutes and you got a three and a half or four pounder, you know? And it's like everywhere we go, that that's a good one, you know? Like, you can weigh those in on Okeechobee, Murray, wherever. So that's really what it feels like. And then whenever you get off to a fast start like that, that gives you the momentum and it gives you the time in the middle of the day to really give things some time and like make those decisions to say, this looked decent in practice. They look good in practice, but I didn't get a bite off of it. Let's go check it. Or I seen this and I never got a chance to fish it in practice. Let's go check it. And, and it doesn't eat you up that bad to waste 15 or 20 minutes. But now if you're sitting on zero and it's 1030, you don't really feel like you can waste the 20 or 30 minutes. So it really just feels like this year, Every time I've dropped my trolling motor after blast off, we went straight to catching them. And I don't really know why, with the exception of Murray. And there was a herring spawn and everybody was catching all five of their fish in the first two hours. And I can't get a bite till nine o'clock. So besides that one, though, every single tournament, it's like, well, wherever I thought I was going to catch them in practice, I pull up there and, and I catch them. And I, I don't, it's never been like that before for me. Like, it seems like wow. er, even other times in the elite series, it's like, Whatever I thought was going to work in practice, it don't work. And then I'll make adjustments to start catching them. And, you know, this year, just like where I thought it was going to work, has just worked. When you, so, go in, when you go into a tournament day, is it all about that first stop for you? Like, did stop two get built off of stop one or in your head? Do you know, okay, I'm going to go to one. If that doesn't work, then I'll stop at two and three, you know, so yeah. on. So, only thing I plan out is where I start at. That's literally the only thing that I plan out is my first stop. From there, it's all about, you know, trying to adjust with the conditions and, you know, fish the moment, all that type of stuff. But sometimes I'll go into tournaments where you've got four or five places where it's like, I'm definitely going to stop at some point today. It doesn't mean I'm going to leave from one and run straight to another and, you know, run all five of them in a row. But it's like, there's four or five places that I'm not going to drive by without stopping on. But the only thing I ever plan is my first spot, typically. And then I'll adjust from there, you know, and that's that's just kind of the way that I've always been. It seems like if I get in the if I get in the habit of trying to game plan it out and have like seven or eight places in a row, well, whenever you start to feel like it's not working, then you've got four more places that you have to run, you know, to stay in your plan. So you run the next four too fast and it's already not working and you should have already made the change. So I like to just go wherever I feel like I'm going to get a bite. Like it doesn't matter if it's a 12 incher, five pounder, whatever. I just want to keep setting the hook. And if it's a place that I've got previous history, that's fine. But if an hour into the tournament, I'm like, Hey, I hadn't caught one off a of penny warp mat all week in practice, but I've already had a bite off one. I'll go run those for 30 minutes, you know? So I, I just adjust constantly all day and it makes me have lulls, but it also makes me catch them four or five different ways throughout a day. Yeah. So I'm not really on a pattern. I'll catch one punching, one doing this, all, all the type of stuff, whenever it may be in practice, the only thing I can catch them on is a swim gym, you know? And then it just, it just changes like that throughout the tournaments. And I think a lot of it's got to do with boat pressure and it's not fishing. Like you hear about all the time, people catch them Monday, Tuesday, they bite. Them. And then Saturday, they don't. Well, yeah. on Saturday, they're, there's 110 boats in the tournament, but there's also 200 boats driving around. So yeah, yeah they're not biting. They're not biting a frog as good because there's boat weights hitting everything, you know. So I feel like that changes it more than anything, and you don't get to see that in practice because in practice, 
20 boats will put in at the ramp or blasting off from, and then everybody else is just spread out, you know? So you don't really get to see how much it actually hurts an area until a hundred boats drive through it or, or whatever happens, you know, or pleasure boaters and all that stuff. So I think that's what uh, makes them not bite in practice then, or bite in practice and not bite the tournament is all them boats run around and boat wakes and all that stuff. I think it hurts them. So every time I ever get too locked in on a bite, it just don't seem to be the same. Or if I'm, you know, trying to run four or five places like I was talking about, it just it's never the same in the tournament. Like it's never the same. And I don't even know if that's why, but to me that feels like why. And it could be because I grew up fishing a lot of lakes with seawalls. So I know yeah. but what hurts it there, you know. So I'm just kind of already weary of them. Yeah, I mean, it might just be you. Like to but if yeah. it is it, but if it is, but truth be told, if that is you, like if it's just in your head that they it's a weird game where they're not going to bite when that starts to, you know, oh, you know yeah. what I mean? If you're in your yeah. head, you're like, yeah, that's screwing it up. All you need to do is plant that little seed. And it, 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 I mean, it's just such a weird sport that way. Like, yeah. do you ever just, how often, I don't, I shouldn't say, do you ever, cause I'm, I'm sure of this. How often do you pick up a bait pre-fishing during the tournament, whenever, and just know, like, before that bait even touches the water, like in the air, you're like, they're going to smash this. Yeah. I mean, you, you can tell, you know, <laughs> like you'll just get to the ramp, you know, some mornings and be like, they going to bite this today, you know, and you might have to rig one up or whatever, but it, it happens a pretty good bit. <clears throat> like before we got to Seminole, I knew what I was going to throw the whole tournament. Like I was like, all I got to do is just see the potential in practice but, but I, I, I fished the Chattahoochee River my whole life, you know. I've never fished Seminole, but I fished the Chattahoochee River my whole life. And I know what they bite pre spawn there, you know, on, on the rest of the river. And I was like, if I just knew what they were going to bite. And then we got there and the water color was right. The water temp was right. As soon as I put the boat in the water, I was like, yeah, they're going to need to swim jig this week. And I caught like all 14 of my 15 on it that, that entire week, you know. And it's not because I'd caught them on it there before. Just like you said, the conditions were just just right, you know. Everything was perfect for it. How important is is it on the elite series to be that guy that does his own thing? You know, like the, I mean, we all know how the the pitfalls of chasing doc talk and that sort of thing, yeah. but it just seems more and more that it's it's not one way efficient. It, it's like when you can line up the body of water to the way you know how to catch him best, it's lights out. Do you agree with what I'm saying there? Or oh, it's a hundred percent. And the reason for that is, is whenever you do what you know, you can make adjustments quicker. Like if you're really good at fishing a certain technique and I'm not, well, it, it'll take you two casts to say, I didn't throw to two really good spots. I should have got a bite. Let me throw something else in there where I might be dragging that thing for like 50 minutes, you know, or, or, or an hour before I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe it is the bait, you know, but well, whenever you understand what you're doing, Everything just flows a lot better. You can make adjustments. You understand what you can get away with, what you can't get away with, where you can run it, all, all that type of stuff. That's why fishing your strengths works so well is because you never get pigeonholed into something. Like the, the term is where you do bad is you go try to do something different on a lake that you don't know, and you've got one spot where it's working, you know, and that's not ever going to hold up. But whenever you're fishing your strengths, you just understand the adjustments to make and exactly what you're looking for. I mean, you... You can fish your strengths with no practice, but but you, you can't fish something that you're not good at with no practice. And that's the difference because when stuff changes, you can just run with, you know, things that you already know. And that's definitely why, because you can just be way more efficient on the water as far as decision making when you understand what you're doing. Do you have to fish? As a, regardless of tournaments or anything, but like, it, do you physically, mentally, whatever way, do you have to fish? I I think so. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've never tried to not, but uh, I don't think <laughs> do it. <laughs> well, don't try it. I mean, you've figured it out so far. Don't don't try not fishing. Yeah. But I I just think that most of the great anglers, competitive or non, you know, whether they're TV, they have to fish. Like it's there's something bred in you. Like, and if you don't have that in you. Like there is people that come along that you think like, oh, wow, that's somebody who loves the hoopla around the tournaments and stuff like that. But they, yeah. if you don't have that 
you're not mad at them and you don't have that. I need to be on the water figuring something out all the time. I just don't, it, it doesn't seem to last as long for, for people. Um, but you definitely seem like one of those dudes who's constantly yeah. trying to crack the nut. Yeah. I wish we had 20 tournaments a year. Really? Like, I want to fish that much. Yeah. Like I, I fish almost every day at home. Like I love. It. So what would an average, okay. So week off you're at home, you've got no sponsor commitments. You've got nothing, no tournament to get ready for. I'm sure that seems like a long time ago for you, yeah. but, but you've got a week off. Do you, do you and Hunter hanging out? What, what is it? The average, like when you say you fish every day, how many hours you fish in a day and where? So I'm going to say on an average week at home during the summer, I'm probably going to fish four or five days, probably. Now, some of them I may only fish for three or four hours because we have a lot of night tournaments. And I mean, since, yeah. since I've been back from Sabine, I have pretty much fished Tuesday night tournaments, Wednesday night tournaments, Thursday night tournaments, and Saturday tournaments. So, and then also fish, you know, on Fridays and stuff too. So, I mean, I fish a lot, but it's, it's not always, it's not like I'm going out there from daylight till dark, 14, 15 hours a day, you know, but if I'm sitting at home. I'm in. Hey, the boat's already hooked up. I'm not that far from the lake. Might as well. So does that, when you're, is it your need to be on the water? Is it your need to compete? It, or is it also investing in your future? The more you're fishing, the better you're going to be when these next three tournaments finally do happen. It just, you know, there, there's some times where I go out there and I'm actually actively trying to improve at something. Like whenever Ford faced Sonar when first came out, and I got one, it was like every day, that's all I want to do is just go put the time in with it, you know? But even besides that, you know, I have fished shallow and just went and flipped wood and threw a frog for just thousands and thousands of hours. And I still just want to go do it again, you know? So it's not always that I'm trying to work on something that'll help my career, but it's just like, I just want to go, man. Like, I just want to go, go reel some in. I can't help it. Now, were you like that your whole life? Like, at what age yeah. do you remember being that driven to to go reel something in? I, I mean, I remember being, you know, obviously before you're 16, you can't hardly get anywhere, you know. Yeah. But, you know, so, but after I was 16, I get out of school and I drive to a bridge and go throw a square bill under the bridge and catch some or, you know, just fish all the time. And every chance I got, I was trying to go to the lake. So, I mean, it's just, it's just been, I feel like my entire life has been just an obsession of just wanting to go fish. Like my mom still tells me that whenever we, I was, you know, five or six years old, she would drive the long way home to go. So she wouldn't drive over a bridge because we drove over a bridge. I want to get out and fish. So she would dr drive the long way around, you know? So I feel like it's just always been like that. I don't, I don't know why it's just, I've been obsessed with it forever. Yeah. It, it's a it's a it's a maddening drug really it is like you know you look at the amount of time that people i mean i get that like that whole like you need to take a new route home because like there's no no matter how many times they told you not to do that there's no you need to fish like it's just yeah. a it's a and, weird bred in thing and and you can't solve it you know yeah like my my younger brothers played video games and stuff like that and when a game would come out they would just want to play it and play it and play it and play it until they beat it. Then when they beat it, that's a new game. It's got to be a new game. But you can't beat bass fish, you know. It's it's forever. You act, you feel like you don't know what you're doing, you know. Like, no matter what, there's going to be days where you're like, am I just not good at this, you know. And, and that's kind of part of the driving factor, I feel like, is you can't solve it. It's, it's, it's not chess, you know. You can't solve it. Yeah, at best, you may solve it for a few moments in time. You know what I mean? Right. Like You yeah. might, like literally, even when you're winning, a, you win an event, you watch. I mean, that angler solved it for just a very brief moment in time, and and then it's gone. It. Um, did you ever play video games growing up? A very, very little, you know. <clears throat> I, I just wasn't for me. I played poker on the internet, but uh, I didn't play – video games very much i would play with my little brother some but i like being outside so so you're not joining brandon cobb and shane lehue and people like that for late night gaming sessions is that what i'm hearing <laughs> i'm not i didn't even know that was a thing 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy that you're competing against, Franco, the year loves to stay up till. I mean, the best thing you could do to distract him is just get a bunch of people to trash talk him on Call of Duty or whatever, and like he plays till six, seven hours. Like he's nuts. Like, but that's also what I love about the Elite Series. All of, I mean, I think all you guys are a little bit nuts. You have to be to just yeah. like to watch bass on TV and be like, yeah, I think I want to be one of those guys. I think I can do that. I mean, there is a little bit of craziness involved in anybody that takes a shot at this game. Do you not agree with that? hundred percent. You have to be a little bit out there, you know, because you direct your life at something, you know, that's a long shot in the first place and you're never going to make millions of dollars a year. So like there's better avenues you know, if you're going to try to get to the top of something, but it's just, you just got to do it. Like you just, like you said, some people just have to fish. Getting so close to winning the classic. Did, did that affect anything moving? I mean, I mean, writers would want to say, Oh, you know what I mean? Because up until that point, you didn't have any, like I said, any speed bumps at all, but you got so close to winning the classic people thought, there were people in the crowd that thought, I mean, that's a traumatizing experience in itself, I think. Yeah. Um, did that affect anything last year? You know, my worst two events last year were before the Classic. I had, a, I had you know, my two worst ever were yeah. the two Florida tournaments before the Classic, that we got done with the Classic, and I made the cut at Stan T. And then I struggled off and on for the rest of the year. So, I mean... I don't think so, but realistically, it has to at least a little, you know, like it just you don't walk away from that just completely like, yeah, that's fine. You know, you don't like it no matter what. I don't think it affected anything on the water, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it did. I just I don't think it did. But and my main reason saying that is I left Florida with two 80s or like yeah. an 89th 80th. So I was already in the hole before we ever even got to the classic. What what is that like to recover from? Because it is such a weird thing that people go through. You know, you there's so much lights and hoopla. You know what I mean? And you're gonna weigh fish, and then you go up there, and it's like boom, boom. You're walking off the stage. Some other dude's holding a trophy that you yeah. like. Does that take days, weeks? months like what does that take to recover from it's gonna sound weird but like in the exact moment you know obviously i'm like dang that's not the outcome we dreamed about you know yeah. like that's whenever you think about the day three way into the classic you don't think about walking off right before the confetti falls yeah but you know i wasn't i didn't feel at least that been out of shape about it you know, like literally the way that I see it is it's an opportunity. It's not like I'm supposed to win. It's not like any of the 50 are supposed to win, but they all have a shot to win. And just getting that close, it's just an opportunity. And if I keep doing that in my career, eventually I'll get one, you know? So I just want to keep, you know, staying in contention for stuff like that. And eventually it's going to work out, but I didn't leave there like, you know, man, that was mine. I should have won it, all that type of stuff. I just left there like, man, we got really close to changing our life, you know, and if we keep at it, eventually it'll happen. And that that's literally the approach. And, I mean, that's just the way that I feel about it, you know. Like, it's, it's a chance, but it's not like any of us are supposed to win. Did it make it easier that Christy was the one that won it? No, I don't care who wins. <laughs> no, okay, no, no, it don't matter to me at all. That's what I love about you. No. Another dude would give like a politically correct. Oh yeah, no, I don't give a damn. I want to win. <laughs> no, like, it don't matter to me. One bit. Who wants? Who wasn't me? It's <laughs> a great answer, and I love it because it's so honest. But I mean, it's one of those questions that I ask pretty routinely yeah. of th situations like this. And people, there's sometimes people answer questions with stuff that you know isn't true. Like, you're yeah. like, did that hurt you? Like, did that hurt you to lose that term? Yeah, freaking right it did. It sucks. Yeah. It's, but but 
it's weird how our world is so full of people that just don't want to admit that stuff anymore. Yeah. That side of fishing, the, the business side of fishing, do you look at the business end of fishing and the tournament end of fishing as one thing, or are they two totally different elements? They're very, very different to me, you know, but it just kind of depends on the sponsors that you have and, yeah. you know, how much time, basically how much you value your time. And, you know, I try to allot everything that I can to the tournaments. I try to get all of my sponsors and all the business things to <clears throat> revolve around the tournaments. I try yeah. not to do a lot of extra stuff on the side but obviously you have to at some at you know a few times throughout the year but they're very very different and it just depends on the businesses that you work with because some companies really really value the elite series head and shoulders above everything else and then some companies really want you to plug them on youtube you know and then some companies so it's kind of a balancing act between all of them but for the most part they're very very different but I try to force them kind of to be one thing and it is working pretty decent, I guess. Do, do you, that was my next question, how that end of business is going, because I, I mean, I would think, dude, you're one of those guys. You're, I mean, whether it's your peers, whether it's people in the industry and people are like, well, where's, where's the future of this sport going? You're one of the names. You're one of those dudes. And I know maybe you don't want, you, you know, you're, not going to admit that, but you're definitely one of those dudes. Do you feel your value? You Does this sponsor thing going well for you? Like it, if it's not going well for you, I mean, it, it must really suck for some others. It's the point I yeah. guess I'm trying to make. No, I feel like it's going really well. Like I feel like it's going probably better than I thought it would have from before my rookie season, you know, like right. whenever I thought about what it would be like, four years in it's probably better now than I actually thought it would but you know like you said as far as being the future of the sport that's what I want to be you know like that's definitely what I'm working to become is like that's where I want my name you know because I know who else is in there and how good they are so that's that's kind of I'm trying to fight for my spot in that you know up and coming group but I'd say it's going pretty good you know really good and that a lot of that's you know because of bass and I caught a 10 pounder in my first tournament, you know, that guy played 80 million times. And then, you know, just a lot of things like that. I've been really fortunate that I've had things like that happen. Like I could have just as easy had a Marshall that wasn't filming when I caught the 10. And then that's like, how are people that found out who I was from that one video just would have never happened, you know, and a couple of things like that, that don't happen. You're talking about a hundred thousand people that have never even seen you. Because the only reason they've seen you is from a video like that or me falling in the water or something like that. Like, th that's the kind of stuff that actually gets your name out there, you know? Yeah. I I think the real reason why you are generating the excitement, I mean, sure, there's catching 10-pounders doesn't suck. And falling in the water to always gets traffic. Just ask Bill yeah. Dance. Um, but He made a career out of it. No kidding. No kidding. I mean... I, I I really want to talk to him about those videos because I feel that there's a part of me that feels like at some point it had to become an industry. You know what I mean? Nobody screws up that much. At some point, it's like, yeah. we need another DVD for Bass Pro Shops. <laughs> Put a yeah. shin guard on and ram your <laughs> leg into that uh, trailer hitch. Um, that's my theory, but I can't confirm that. One day we'll have Bill on this show and ask him about it, maybe. But um, your... Uh, do you ever feel like you hear in other sports, you hear people say things like, you know, I need to sign the right deals, the right contract so that the few, everybody, you know what I mean? It falls in line. Or do you think that that's a big thing that's missing with the sport of fishing? It's just literally the wild west where people go out and charge what they charge, what they can get and people pay what they, what they want to pay. So I think it, that's really good for the, high-end guys is it being kind of like the wild west the problem is with that is you have people that come in and don't understand their value you yeah. know and so they do they take a lot less money than they sh really should have got 
and it, that's that's not their fault at all. You know, like they have to get whatever they can get whenever you come in as a rookie because you know everybody's not you know trying to pay you a ton of money whenever you might not be there in two years. You know, so companies can't invest a lot of money in you whenever there's a decent shot. You're not going to make it more than two years. You know, yeah. and that's just the fact of being a rookie. So it's really good for the people that understand their value. And it's really bad for people that don't understand their value because it's the wild, wild west from the angler side, but it's also the wild, wild west from the company side, you know, yeah. I'm trying to get more than I'm worth and they're trying to pay less than I'm worth, you know, and that's, that's just, and we kind of meet it about what you're worth, you know, that's just kind of where it goes. So, you know, I feel like if there was some more guidance for people that were just coming in as rookies and didn't mess themselves up, because if you sign a deal that's for not much money, your first year, well, they're not going to say, hey, sorry, we paid you $1,000. Next year, we're going to pay you 30 They're going to say, hey, yeah, you know, we probably paid less. We're going to, we're going to bump you up to 2500 You know, so it just – the way the way the deals increase, if you start off too small, you're just behind forever, you know. That's just kind of the way it goes. So I feel like a little bit of structure would help some people, but it would also hurt some people. But, you know, other sports have agents. We don't have agents. That That makes a big difference you know? Yeah. I mean, and, and there, I mean, there is a few agents, but just very few. And I mean, the ones that have tried it, I mean, I remember Octagon sports got involved. I mean, they, at one time they had Van Damme, they had Clun, they had, I can swindle like the, literally the who's who skeet Reese yep. at the time. And they're also the same agency that represented Michael Phelps at the time. So 10% of KVD's deal, even though it might be a sweet fishing deal, is yeah. nothing like 10% of Michael Phelps's deal. Right. Um, and it's weird too, because I don't I don't know about your experience, but I don't think anybody wants to deal with an agent. Like anytime, no matter how busy you get, you're like, okay, this person can help you get what you need. I feel in the fishing industry, they want to deal. Like if you sent in a dude in a suit, they might not respond to it near as well as you walking in there. Do you, oh, is yeah. that been your experience? Yeah, definitely. You know, like most of these, <clears throat> most of the industries have, you know, or most of the companies have like one marketing person Yeah. and they don't wear a suit, you know, most of the time they're, they're the wildest one that works at the company typically, you know, so they don't like a lot of structure. The marketing guys don't seem to, but the only way that would ever help is if an agent went to, companies that way outside of fishing you yeah know, like they're going to go talk to mcdonald's for you or something like that that's that's the only time it could help it couldn't help in the industry what uh what would you change about the sport of professional bass fishing if you could change any any rule any situation like it doesn't have to be a rule could be anything what would you like to see different in the sport of bass fishing man i don't know i've never really thought about what i would like to change i I just, I like the whole, the whole deal, you know, one thing. No, I guess I was going to say practice is too long, but I, I need it. Like I, I, I use it up, you know, but that's the only, that's the only part of it that I don't like is, or that is sometimes is not fun. It's, you know, practice whenever you're graphing around for 15 hours and shaking them off anyways, you know, but I don't really have a good one that I would really change, you know? I, I kind of just take it for what it is, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you've seen other sides of things like you compare it. Everybody likes to compare fishing to golf, golf and all these, but like you can't even compare it to golf. Like the number, I mean, the number and, and everybody watching this can fix it. All you need to do is tell everybody on your street and everyone, you know, to tune in and watch bass fishing. Cause nobody near the, the, the truth of it is not it's not near the numbers it's an individual sport but those dudes leave tournaments in planes and we're hoping that a buddy tries past us on the way down the road because you might get a blow on your truck yeah. like it, it is a totally different world um but it, it, it's uh I, I mean i i'm akin to you in that way that I don't know. Like, I think it's real easy for everybody to point out what's wrong with everything on earth nowadays. That's what people want to do always. But I think it's a pretty cool, the, the way it works right now. Like, should you guys make more money? Yes. Should you guys have more opportunities? Yes. That sh should always be the answer. But right. that being said, 
a group of dudes get to travel around the world and uh, around the country and fish for a living and an arena gets filled up once a year. And I get it. We don't charge tickets, but it's still pretty like when you compare it to other things, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, no, it, it definitely is. And, and that's the thing is you got some things in the industry that maybe you you don't like, but it's until I have a solution for them, I don't want to just point and blame that, hey, this should be better and this should be better. It's like, well, how does it get better? It's like, well, everybody should make $2 million a year bass fishing. It's like, okay, where does that money come from? You know, <laughs> like it's got to come from somewhere. So, you know, without a solution, it's hard to just point fingers. Yeah. So you don't you don't feel that you'll get any more nerves in these final three events, or do you think that's up for debate when we get there? It's just it you just never know, you know. I don't think I will in the first couple. In the last one, I could see it potentially happening. Like, you know, because like I said, I genuinely believe this is still a long way out. You know, like yeah. I've still got to go. I've still got to go put together nine days in a row of catching probably 22 pounds a day on for six of them and 18 <laughs> or 19 a day for three of them, you know? And I mean, that's not that easy. Like there's still a lot left to do. So <clears throat> if we get a little bit closer and there's like one tournament left, maybe I'll be nervous, but uh, hopefully by the end we'll, got, we'll have a little cushion. Well, that's all up to you. Which one worries you the most of the three? St. Clair, for sure. And it's not not because I'm super confident on the other two, but St. Clair's one where they could be anywhere. And, like, <laughs> you, you could catch them somewhere, and they would not even be close to there tomorrow, you know? Like, there's not a lot of special features there. So it's like <laughs> you just kind of throw it fish. And if the fish are gone, you better find them. Yeah, and that's you can – yeah, and you can catch them there, but not catch them. Like, you can literally go out and be like, man, I had a good day. Like, in, in unloading them, the video will look good. Everything looks great. But then you get to the stage, and it's 18 instead of 20. And all of a sudden, you're yeah. not even anywhere near the cut. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just – it. Uh, that's that's the weird thing about the smallmouth events at the end. Like I obviously personally love smallmouth events. I'm not one of those guys who's like I don't like smallmouth events. I obviously love them, but I I I dislike the fact that that it's hard. It's hard to gain because it's hard to lose too. You know what I mean? Like everybody catches them. Like you have a group of people who drive home from all those tournaments not making the cut, but they still caught them pretty good. They, yeah. you know what I mean? You don't have the failure. Do you? Where are you at with smallmouth events? I like, I do like them now. Now, at first, whenever I first went up north and tried to do that whole drifting deal, yeah, I didn't like it one bit, like not at all. But the times have changed quickly, you know, in the past four years. It's a completely like, if you think back to St. Lawrence River 2018 or whenever, everybody's just out there just drifting hoping one pulls it pulls on their you know worm and now it's you're hunting them down you know it's a completely different style and i like it a lot better like that you know so i i like them now i don't really have a great understanding of them of the small mouth and kind of how the conditions make them move because it's kind of backwards to what a lot of people would think and then every day is kind of different you know like one day they'll act one way in the certain conditions and then something will change and then it's like <clears throat> they're just nowhere to be found or, or they go from four pounders to pound and a halfers. Yeah. And it's, I don't really understand all the nuances of them, but uh, we're just trying to get better at, at catching them, you know, and I've, I've done it for three previous years now fishing for them and I've had bad ones and I've had some decent ones. So <laughs> hopefully, hopefully the only thing left is to have some good ones. What has changed in the last four years from, from the drifting to hunting? What, what is the single reason for that? Oh, it's just, board face sonar you know in 2020 whenever we, we went to st Clair in 2020 and the guys that had it just top 10 oh. like that's just that, that's just what happened like the people who had forward face sonar made the top 10 i yeah. don't know if any had it and didn't make the top 10 and then <clears throat> and then patrick won on lake fork and then from then on it's like nobody just drags around deep anymore like why would you 
you can just troll to them instead, you know? So, I mean, it just, it just changed everything, you know, and it also, also made it where it closed the gap a lot on the guys who had a ton of experience, Yeah, you know, small, it really closed the gap. Like now it's hard for them guys to get separation. I mean, the Canadians and Polinick, they, they were head and shoulders above everybody for, for, you know, a while. And then they're still, you know, better than almost everybody else now, but they just can't gain the separation that they could gain four or five or six years ago. Like it was just obvious, like that they were going to top 10 every smallmouth tournament and they still pretty much do. But, you know, it just seemed like there was more separation between the best and the worst five years ago than there is now. Do you think, um, what's your take on forward facing sonar? Is it a good thing, bad thing? It can be. I think it's a. After seeing what Bass did at the classic and showing it actually on the screen. Yeah. That 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 kind of bridged the gap between it's kind of bad to watch. And it is kind of when whenever you're watching it on TV, it is kind of boring to watch somebody just troll around and then pitch a spinning rod to something and fight whatever fish they catch for three and a half minutes and then land it, you know, like that's not that exciting. But when they showed it on the screen at the classic, I thought that was really, really cool. And that was a really, really good look. And it kind of bridged the gap of what kind of let the people watching see what, you know, Gussie's actually looking at. Yeah. Now, I don't think it's going to hurt the fisheries like bass and stuff like that. Like the crappy might be in trouble like that. That they may that they may be in trouble, but the bass, I think, I think they're they're fine as far as like actually hurts the fisheries. But I did think it was you know boring to watch. I still think it's more boring to watch than you know like Sabine, even though they're pound and halfers. Like that's fun to watch. You know, somebody catch them flipping or throwing a spinner bait or whatever or a little popper or, or what whatever they're doing. Like, that's fun to watch. But you know, if they keep showing the screen, I think it'll be it'll be good for you know, the four faces on our events and I hope they do it in the next one. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm right there with you, dude. I, I think that I don't, I think it's not that exciting to watch. Even when you show it on the screen, I think that bridges the gap and it makes it cooler. And it, and it's an incredible learning opportunity because not only are you being entertained by that, but you're literally seeing exactly what the angler sees and how to pick up, you know, it's the best educational. I had a bunch of people, you could just see them watching the classic and they're like, it all, it all just kind of connected. Right. Um, but I do, I find myself missing bass fishing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and Sabine river was a prime example last year. I mean, I use Oahe and lacrosse as a prime example. Oahe had every reason to stand out and just be the coolest tournament ever. I mean, you're, you're in somewhere that just looks different than anywhere you've ever been. You know, there's bison along the shore, but it was just dudes texting. That's what it was like watching a group of people texting. They're pretty boring. And then we went to lacrosse and it was back to like fish blowing up on frogs and jigs and just all that sort of stuff that I think we all fell in love with. But, um, do you think long term it will change the fisheries? Do you, th you know, like that thought of people thinking that, you know, one day they're going to stop, you know, there won't be no much pressure on the bank. But I mean, forward facing sonar seems to be a player on the bank now, too. It's like it doesn't have a limit, does it? Yeah, I don't think. I, at first, I was, I would say I was optimistic that <laughs> the, fish, the fish that live on the bank would, would get less pressure. But I mean, you can catch them in three or four feet with it, you know, yeah. like easy. So if those fish ever slide off the bank and I think the fish that live on the bank, like, you know, like if you cast to the bank and a fish bites your bait, he swims straight off the bank out of the deep water, you know, like it ain't like he lives on the bank. Like he probably moves back and forth. So it's the same fish getting caught on the bank, off the bank, whatever. But I'm interested to see how they, are going to act long-term if they get accustomed to the actual frequency that it puts off. Cause that's, what's going to be interesting. Like, are we going to have to start casting like 130 feet to get them to bite? Because now it seems pretty tough to get one to bite if they're within like 40 feet, like it's yeah. really tough to bite. So is the next thing like casting 150 feet? Cause I mean, 150 feet is a long cast. Like it's hard to cast that far, but I mean, 
maybe that's the way it's going if they do get conditions to the actual frequency of it. But other than that, I just think they're all going to get caught forever, you know? (laughs) I think that I think they will adjust to it. I mean, I think that they've proven that. Like, you know, just like regular 2D sonar, you used to be able to catch everyone you dropped on in the Great Lakes. I mean, it was just, you know, 80 to 90 percent of them you would eat right away. And now it's like the numbers have flipped the other way. Now you got, you know, tw- 10 to 20 percent of them eat right away. Most of them you got to cast to if you mark, you know, if you mark them, it's too late almost. So I would imagine that's my thought. But I mean, the guy that I always give credit to on that, like Seth Fire said that four years ago, he's like, dude, five years from now, it's going to be a casting contest. It's going to be who has the graph that sees the furthest and whoever can cast to the unsuspecting fish. And yeah. um, if it does go that way, I feel bad because Koya Fujita has got 17 on his boat. So how <laughs> can anyone... <laughs> Like, does, does that blow you away how many units he's running? Actually, I don't even know how many he's running. Six. Six. So he's got three up front and three at the console. Yeah. Yeah. Anything more than that, I don't see the point of. <laughs> I, I could kind of see, I could kind of see six, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll never have that many. Like, there's, there's just no way. Like, I remember going from one unit to two, and it's like for the first month, I was hitting it with my rod, my bait. I, I just had nowhere to stand. It's like, what's going on? So, and now I have two all the time and I've kind of got used to it, but I can just imagine putting three or four up front or something. I mean, you literally could not fish shallow. Like you couldn't skip a dock. You'd have a barrier all the way around, around the front of the boat. Like, well, what are you going to do? So, I mean, I, I mean, that's the way it's going to go though. I think more and more people are going to have more and more graphs, you know, like if you think back 10 years ago, a lot of guys had one and one you know just two and then i got to where it was just everybody had four and i would yeah. imagine here's everybody have five or six yeah it's uh i mean i don't see it slowing down anytime soon it's insane it, it really is who uh growing up did you did you have a pro angler that you look to that you know what that was your favorite pro your idol whatever or, or were you just all about the fish so I just kind of watched them all. I didn't really have somebody yeah. that I really, you know, I would say for a while, I liked Brian Thrift a lot, the way that he fished yeah. after a little bit older and just kind of his style. That I really liked the way that he, you know, actually competed. I really liked his style the best, but I kind of just had a ton of respect for all of them and just liked, you know, watching any of them, you know, like just to, Everybody has their own kind of deal. Like, if you want to watch somebody flip, you want to watch Hackney flip, you know? You want to watch somebody with a spinning rod. I want to watch Aaron Martins, you know? If I want to learn something like that, so I want to learn from. So I just kind of respected everybody for their – what they were kind of an expert at, you know? Yeah. Do you um, do you absorb much footage after the event? Like, good, bad, or indifferent? Like, when you leave an event, do you – do you watch any of the live on the way home or anything like that? I I don't unless it's one of my friends is doing super well or is about to win or something, you know. So I I really don't. I'll see highlights after the event on Instagram or whatever from Bass posting them or other people posting them or something. But I I really don't, and maybe I should. But for me, I, that's that's history, you know. What about your own footage? Everything you shoot for youtube have you ever found yourself kind of looking back at lost fish or anything like that to learn from it now i do that a lot yeah like i do that a whole lot i'll go i'll go watch like if i lose one or something happens i'll go back and completely watch i'll watch it like 50 times and just figure out exactly what i was doing and if if i did something wrong or whatever so yeah i i actually watch my own footage a ton that uh, that's the thing that blows me away that more guys don't do, especially with now. I mean, you guys have to have a camera on your boat at all times. I mean, you're always documenting for your channel as it is, but I mean, you also have to have a camera on. Everyone's got to have a camera on at all times. So it amazes me that you don't see it happen more, but I just think it's, it's also one of the realities of our sport. I mean, there's not a lot of downtime. I mean, if you're a golfer, 
How long does a golf game last? Four hours? You got a whole lot the rest of the day to figure stuff out. I mean, there's only so many trips to the clubhouse you can make. So you got you gotta critique things. Um, most of those adjustments that you make, is it like a physical thing that you pick up on? Like, do you have you had situations where you're like, I'm not setting the hook right or I'm not moving the fish quick enough? Like, what things have you identified through your own footage? So I I have went back and watched and thought that I, you know, like I throw a frog a lot, obviously. And there's certain times where if you're in current or the boat's moving fast or whatever, you'll get a bow in your line, like your bait's out on the bank, but then your boat's moving. So you get a bow in your line and I'll go back and I try to be very conscious that I take up the slack before I set the hook. And some people don't, when he bites, you just swing. And sometimes I do that, but I go back and I, I, I've seen myself doing that a few times I did it on, on Okeechobee and it, it got me on a big one that would have gave me a top 10. Like that's definitely what happened too. Cause I was going like a hundred miles an hour and I threw up beside a mat and fish came out and ate it. And I set the hook and it was like, my rod went all the way to about right here before it ever even got any tension on it, you know? So I should have just took up two feet of slack and I'll go back and watch. Like last year, I'd go back and watch the way that I fished through areas. I did that quite a bit. See if I was going too fast or if I was rushing it or if I was, you know, doing anything that to me stuck out. And I kind of wanted to find something, to be honest with you, because I wanted yeah. something to And I saw some things that I did that I thought weren't perfect, but, you know, for the most part, fish just come off and you make some bad decisions. You know, a lot of times you do everything right and it still comes off. And that's that seems to be the case most of the time. Now, not that I do everything perfect, but it's like, you know, I did stuff good enough where I should have caught it, you know, and that's, that's what happens most of the time. But every once in a while you'll see that, yeah, that was dumb. I definitely should have did something different. Yeah. And then there's fish that you see that you're like, how in the world did I not lose this fish? Like that fish has oh. every reason on earth to get off and it doesn't. <clears throat> who do you, uh, who do you look up to in the elite series or do you look up to anyone in the elite series, whether it be, from a competitive standpoint, from a business standpoint? I talk to Swindle a lot, you know, about the business side and fishing and all kinds of stuff like that. So I would say as far as getting advice or something, as far as a career goes, he'd be the one that I would ask or, you know, look up to for that type of stuff. And he's not a bad one to, to ask, you know, stuff like that from, you know. No, he's a pretty good one. And I think – I think that's one of the most amazing things about him right now that, that <clears throat> I don't know if everybody's noticing or paying attention to it, but like swindle has become very much that I don't even want to use the word. Like you can't wear bedazzled jeans and be the elder statesman, but he is one of the, <laughs> you know what I mean? You've got Rick Clun obviously and stuff like that. But I, I just think that swindles at the age where, imparting knowledge and 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 helping competitors is a lot more valuable to him now than maybe it was at other po points in his career um right. which i think is natural that's part of yep. um aging and and just you know realizing and and i think he he gets a kick out of out of you know the relationships he has with people like yourself and and i think he also benefits because you're obviously on the cutting edge on a lot of the stuff you're doing too yeah so is it a situation where you're just like, hey, G, what do I charge for this? Yeah. Or, or is it that direct or what, what kind of conversations are we having? Uh, not it, It's not exactly like that. We just kind of talk about, you know, kind of the way you pitch stuff and kind of the obligations. The thing, the thing I like about him a lot is he values his time a ton. Yeah. You know? And. I probably overvalue my time because like if I'm going to go way out of my way to do something like it needs to be worth my while, you know? So I just kind of ask him kind of the way that he structures stuff and, you know, kind of what he pitches to people and agrees to and stuff like that more than anything. Like I don't say, Hey, how much should I charge? I mean, I, I have, or, or said, what do you think about this or something? But for the most part, it's just kind of about structuring the contracts and not, you know, over agreeing to stuff or what, what kind of what you're getting paid basically. And he's, he's really good about that. I think. Yeah. Hey, dude, there's nothing more valuable in your life than your time. 
<laughs> like right. your entire life. Like literally to say somebody overvalues their time is, I mean, I think if anybody's guilty of undervaluing time, it's professional anglers because the amount right. of time that like some, I mean, and we all have worked hard for different companies many different times, but your time, I mean, especially one of the things that I do love about this generation of anglers, for lack of a better term, is I think a lot of you guys have realized that, you know, I need the time to be the angler that I am, where yep. in the past we've had anglers, you know, and the, it's so hard not to. I mean, the star, it's rising, it's rising for so long you can't get anything. And when you finally are getting that momentum, you don't want to say no to anything. And right. then the next thing you know, the last thing you're in contact with is fish other than the ones in an aquarium at a trade show. And that generally doesn't work out good. <clears throat> um, so what, what's your goal, future goal, like long-term? Is it just to keep knocking at the door and your moments will happen or like, what, when you look at the future, what do you see? Eventually, I want to kick the door down, hopefully. Yeah. But, you know, I my goal is the same every time. And I, I am extremely competitive. So I don't want this to sound like I'm just like, okay, with whatever happens. No, I, I, I want to win everything. Like, that's that's what I want. But the best way I know how to go about doing that is to just try to get better as fast as I possibly can and as much as I possibly can. Like, if I could just increase 1% a month, whatever, that's fine with me. Like, let's just keep improving, keep keep getting better and keep getting better and keep getting better. And that's kind of the way that I have structured everything around, you know, like I feel like there's a time where you could fish your strengths and be a pro everywhere we went and do really, really well. And now it's like that time is gone unless your strengths forward face sonar. So I knew that like eventually, and I didn't, that's not what happened last year. Actually, some of my best finishes last year were forward face sonar. But my second year was kind of the first year that I was really using forward face sonar. And I knew there was going to be a learning curve there and that I was going to have like maybe some worse tournaments than I normally would have. But three years from now, it's going to be worth it to maybe sacrifice, I mean, maybe have a bad tournament just to gain the confidence or have a not quite as good tournament just to gain the confidence. I'm not going to go out there and have a bad finish on purpose. But if I feel like that's one of the main deals, I'm going to try to make it work, you know, and I try to or try to make it work in practice or whatever. And if you can't just go do something else. So I knew there was going to be a little bit of, you know, a learning curve there that might have hurt some results at some point. And I can't point to a time where that happened or anything, but I'm OK with stuff like that happening because five years down the road, I'll be that much better, you know. And I try to do all that stuff at home, whatever stuff's not on the line, but like I'll do whatever I can to just keep improving and eventually kick that door down i i think it's coming I, I i think i mean you you've been very close to a lot of really cool things and once again you're in contention here this year i think i think it's coming i mean uh I, I, dude when you look at the, the amount of times like i mean the classic was so close this mm -hmm. you've been close to both now yep <laughs> this one's you're still in the running yeah. Which which is more valuable to you, do you think? Winning the classic uh, or winning the angler of the year? At this point in my career, if you had to make me pick one, I would say the classic is more valuable. And that's only because yeah. how much I'm, it's more money off the off the beginning, but it's also so much more sponsorship and exposure, stuff like that. But I would much I would be much more proud of Angler of the Year. And it's not even close. Yeah, it's I mean, you can't they're not they're not close, but I, it's also to me, it's also not close. Like as far as it's wrong the way it is, but it is that like it, the anglers will all tell you angler of the year, but there's no party like winning the Bassmaster Classic <laughs> and the entire industry's eyes are on it. it. It's 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 weird that way. But but I think that you will threaten for both for 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 many years to come. Um, one, one relationship. Here's one thing that blew me away. Last time we talked, are you still like your diet? Is it still a certain way around events and stuff like that? You weren't eating bread because it didn't make your brain work fast enough, which yeah. explains a lot about me. Uh, yeah. Are you, are you yeah. still on that kick? 
I'm not on it quite as strict as I was, but yeah, still no bread, as as li little sugar as possible. You know, like that's basically what I try to do. You know, so that's I'm still pretty good on it. Not quite as strict as I was at one point, but I still I don't eat any bread though or sugar that much sugar stuff around around tournaments or try not to anytime. But we got a month off or something. You know, you might have to get a cheeseburger here and there. So do you actually physically, do you think you feel like if let's say the night before the final event of the year, you're late in angle of the year. And I'm like, let's go grab a grease wheel while we're, while we're in New York and get ourselves a pepperoni pizza. Do you like, do you feel the effects of that the next day? Like, what, what, is it in your, is it just sluggish? Well, what does it feel like to you? Yeah, huh. It feels, it feels sluggish and I, like, I feel sluggish. I feel slow. I feel heavy. Like I don't yeah. feel light on my feet. Like it's just, it's just bad all the way around. And I, <clears throat> I got all way, those symptoms just so you know, well, the like, sluggish, the feeling heavy. I think I agree. <laughs> that's what I feel. I'm like, everybody else just feels like this all the time and they don't know what it's like to feel better. You know, Yeah. that's kind of, kind of sad, but like sugars just, really really bad for the body you know yeah yeah no it's it's uh many people think it'll be it'll be our cigarettes you know this generation cigarettes down the road people will be like what were you guys thinking but <laughs> yeah. uh I, I, i'm not saying that they're wrong what about wheeler your relationship with wheeler i mean i think that's there's two i mean one of the things that stands out to me is Wheeler is always one of those people. And you're definitely one of those people. Like I'm intrigued by certain individuals and I don't know what it is. Like I can't put my finger on, but there's certain people you meet and you're like, that dude doesn't compute things the same as everybody else, which I love, you know, I love seeing that, but you and Wheeler are very much that way. And to know that you guys are buddies, do you, do you learn from him in that similar situation? Like you do with swindle or is it more just fishing buddies? No, we, we talk about a lot of stuff and we're, we're, you know, really good friends, but I, I a lot of times we can't talk about actual yeah. fish, you know, we can just talk about generalities or, you know, what we're catching them on at home or something like that. But he just, he's on another level than everybody, you know, just the knowledge that he has, the way that he thinks outside the box for tournaments and stuff like that. And, the level of focus that he has is unattainable for a regular person. Like you just, nobody can focus like that. Like he just is that zoned in during practice and tournaments and before practice and stuff like that. It's just, that's what I feel like separates him so much is he knows more than you. He knows how to catch them and trigger them and find them better than you. And he's more focused. So it's like, you're just fighting uphill, you know, there's nothing you can do. How are you with focus on the water? Like what percentage of your competition day are you close to a hundred percent focused on the task at hand? So whenever I'm making really good decisions, I, I can feel almost the minute that it starts to drift. You know, there's like a minute where you start to lose confidence and I can, sometimes I can feel it really quickly. And then it's time, then that's whenever I usually make an adjustment. And then sometimes it, I force it a little bit and it might take me 30 or 45 minutes or an hour before I ever actually make a major adjustment that I should have already made. But whenever I'm in a good spot or have a lot of confidence and everything's going, I have phenomenal focus, but I can feel it whenever things aren't going perfect, start to just get a little bit off. And that's whenever I start making the adjustments. So do you have a mental routine at that point? Like as soon as you feel that, like what's you say you make adjustments, like how, how do those adjustments happen? So I'll just try to think about exactly the place where I feel like I can get a bite. Like I want to go get a bite. And a lot of times I'll throw baits that I get like tactile feedback from, and that might sound weird, but like if I'm just like winding a spinner bait or something like that, it's very easy to go too fast because you're just winding, yeah. you know? So whenever you get rushed, you're just like, but then whenever you're throwing like a jig or something in your, or a shaky head or whatever, and you're dragging on rocks, it's just a lot easier to focus in on what your bait's doing. Or, or even if like I'm throwing a vibrating jig or something, I can feel it so well. It's very easy to figure out what my bait's doing or a topwater 
or if I'm throwing a wacky rig or anything where I know exactly how the bait's performing, I feel like it's very easy for me to, to dial in and know that I'm fishing the piece of cover like perfectly. I feel like there's certain baits though that whenever I start going fast, I just can't pick them up because then I just know that I'm going to, it's too easy to make mistakes with certain baits. Is speed, if you would narrow it down, is speed the thing that gets anglers? Like, and, and, the, and the greatest angler of all time is known for speed. And, and trust me, it's shocking when you watch KVD fish, how fast it is. You think you've seen fast and this is a whole different level of fast. But it fe feels like to me that it's also like speed is what you like. Whenever I've seen an angler, when nerves start to get into an angler in a situation, it's all they start speeding up. Is speed the enemy of the angler? I don't think it has anything to do with speed, but it's forcing it is the problem. And whenever you start forcing it, you just kick the trail motor up. You start roll, you start going fast. You possibly can and just covering water. And a lot of times it's not the right water to be covering, you know, like. The only thing that gets anglers to do bad is not throwing in front of them. And that is just point blank. Like that's what it is. And a lot of times when you start going fast, you start fishing a lot of water that's not productive. And that's whenever it becomes a that's whenever it becomes a problem. You can fish fast as you want to through good water. But you can't just like say, I'm gonna fish this entire creek, even if it takes me two hours. Like that might be the wrong move, you know, or just to force it is the wrong move. It's just that that's what I feel. I don't think it's the speed. I think it's the the speed is a product of forcing it in the wrong areas at the wrong time with the wrong bait. I like the way you think. You think different, man, and it's very cool. It's very cool. But you are an angler, so I'm sure you've done some stupid stuff. What's the dumbest thing you've ever done to catch a bass? <sighs> Probably fell off the boat. <laughs> <laughs> I, so we counted it up. I was standing on my trolling motor, set the hook, fell off the boat. And I think it was 16 seconds I was standing back on the trolling motor, throwing back at the fish. So I literally got out of the water, stood back up, and then I called him like three minutes later. <laughs> I I, I th thought it was a good display of agility. I mean, yeah. <laughs> people like myself would need trim back in the motor with the big motor. I just have to hold on. And you were back that back at it right away. Dude, I think you're an amazing uh, angler, an amazing individual, and I think you have an amazing future. I don't care what happens the rest of this year. I, I would love to see you hold that trophy, but, but I, dude, you are one of the most uh, puzzling minds in this sport to me. And I don't mean that in a good way. I mean, in a bad way. I mean that in a very good way. It, it, it Dude, the way you think is very, very much, it doesn't match your resume but I don't think it'll stay that way for very long. I think your resume is, uh, is well on its way to uh, continuously building and can't thank you enough for doing this. Yep. I, I appreciate you having me and I appreciate the kind words. Also, I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, we'll find out just, just three events and, you know, I cast and all months, though. <laughs> yeah, 10,000 podcasts between now and then. And uh, I'm just thankful that we were one, the one and only Stone Cold Kyle Welcher. I tell you what, it is pretty tough not to cheer for that guy. Um, an amazing mind, an amazing way that uh, Kyle looks at things, and uh, an awesome angler. And I appreciate him coming on here and having such a open, candid, and cool conversation. And um, need to go check out his YouTube channel. It's one that I, I try to watch every single video he puts out. I mean, you, you're you going to learn. You're going to be entertained. Um, and you might just be watching a future Angler of the Year because he is three events away from winning one of the most coveted titles in professional bass fishing. But you better watch out because if you look at our entire top ten, it's crazy. Our Angler of the Year race going into the last three events going to be a nuts one. But that's what you want each and every. I mean, maybe Kyle would like it to be over after the next event, but um, it's going to be tight. It's going to be exciting. Um, and um, that's all I got. Really. I mean, sometimes you just run out. I mean, the guy, the, there's nothing left. The show's over. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Enjoy being and have a great week. 
I ran out of stuff to say. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?